I, it's 6.30 in the morning, so I thought I would lower the lights a little bit because it's just softer on my face. Okay, so update from my last video when I was in Bulldog Canyon, and I had to detour the plant because my dad had a few hospitalizations in six weeks, four times. So I packed up camp and hitched up my trailer and went back to Temecula, California. And he's now, I took care of all the arrangements. He's now home with my mom, but we had to order hospice for him. Now, he's not on death's door, so uh, that's why I'm not over, overly emotional about it. But he does need more medical assistance than my mom's not a caregiver. She's his wife. And it was a rough trip, honestly. Uh, it was rough because, first of all, I'm nervous. I'm I was upset and nervous. It's not really the words I'm looking for. I'm, I'm overwhelmed and emotional about what's happening with my dad. I'm not completely in the dark because I've been communicating this whole time. Concerned, obviously. Knowing that he's 85 and he's got Parkinson's and other health issues and knowing that his time is limited. And so this is the reality of where I'm at to have my coffee. Driving back was long and excruciating. I got there and I made arrangements with my acquaintances or friends or whatever to just park the trailer in front of their construction site house which is a nice, it's a nice, quiet neighborhood with only a few houses on it. It's in wine country. So it actually had really pretty views in the mornings. So I wasn't complaining. It was quiet. It was sufficient. Now that I have the generator and I'm accustomed to boondocking, I, I had a down path. So I was there for five days while I took care of the details with my dad and I got him back home. And then I had to make I had to make a decision because I was like, there was a storm coming to California, another one. And I had already had made arrangements at this RV park in Mesa that I'd already paid for a month and no refunds. You only got 90% of refund if you gave two weeks notice that you weren't going to make it. There was no way I could give two weeks notice. So after I took care of all that business, meanwhile, Caught myself a nice little head cold. My friends and my therapist. Yes, I do have a therapist. I know. I still see one. They all said it was probably stress related because, like the, the stress of getting there and packing up and taking the trailer and all it, just wore me out. And as soon as I got there, after an eight-hour drive with the poor dog in the back seat, all I could do for him was feed him, walk him, let him do his business, stick him in the crate in the trailer, and go see my dad. And I hadn't even eaten all day because I, I don't know what it is about me and travel when I'm driving. The head cold and congestion has stayed with me along with the cough. But anyway, so I made it back here to, to Mesa. The campground that I'm at is adequate. It, it's basically, I got hookups and I got laundry. And it's okay to walk the dog around. But other than that, it's not a, it's not a resort. It's not boondocking it, it's clean it's quiet quiet as far as the residents go it's just but it's right off the street so here all the street traffic and any sirens or anything that might go by but you know what it's okay because i'm saving some expenses right now as i just wait out the weather if it's really what i'm doing kismet was so patient with me because i had to be in bed and if i'm in bed he's got to be in the crate because i can't trust him out in the trailer while I'm sleeping. It's just no way. He's a puppy. It's not like he's a deliberately a bad dog. He just, he's a puppy and he'll chew shit and stuff. Dad's okay as far as for an 85 year old man with Parkinson's and diabetes and heart disease and all the other things that, you know, as his body just completely ages and starts to malfunction or shut down. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. But it's a natural order of life, right? And I have to just accept that is it is coming. And you need some attention? Mm -hmm. Here's Kismet needs some love and attention. I think he's going to appear in every single one of these videos just because he's used to it. He's like, aren't you going to show how cute I am? He's now two weeks shy of being eight months old. 
So he's a big boy. He's big boy. Anyway, getting back to my dad and my mom, I can't even explain how it feels right now. But being on this road trip is very much very important to my personal journey and my healing. Um, as I've been reviewing my journals, I'm almost done with my journal review. In fact, I'm, I'm right now I'm in the one in 2020, which is when COVID began. I've gotten into the point of summer, like, like my first trip to Sedona. And this is a particular journal I'll probably end up keeping for a number of reasons, because this is when my activation was reignited or something. I had this enlightenment. And, and then here I am 20 years later being reactivated. And Sedona, well, the first trip I took out there was really profound, really healing. And it was, it was quite literally just a month after I moved my parents in with me. They'd come to live with, they'd come to stay with me during the COVID, when COVID first started. And I did that because they were elderly and the elderly with respiratory problems, my mom has asthma and COPD, were most at risk. And they were up there in Victorville all by themselves, an hour and a half away. And I wanted to make sure that they were down with me and my son, who was then living with me at the time, and that we would be able to take care of them. And then while they were living with me, can't you see I'm talking to our friends? Can't you see that? Yeah, see? Okay. We're talking to our friends. Okay. Emma, you like to see you in the video. Say hello. Okay. Say hello. Okay, now can you get down? He loves watching himself. We watch other videos of golden retrievers. And so he thinks that all golden retrievers are him. It's really funny because he barks at himself in the reflection of the, the fireplace. Okay, let me finish this, okay? Can you get down? Hey, get down. Good, go to the turn. Thank you. My parents came to stay with us. And then my son and I, we noticed just how fragile they really were. My mom plays a good... She plays a good role of everything's just fine and she's got everything under control. But as we saw them on a day-to-day -day basis and what their daily habits were and what were the fragility of their circumstances, and it was pretty evident that it was time. And in my world, after my brother Brad died, I just had the assumption that I would have to take care of my parents. My brother and I had talked about it, about tag teaming and, and joining forces to do, to take care of them. And... At the time, he had lived in Virginia, and I was living in California, and we were just going to, we just thought we would just split time back and forth or whatever with them. And then Brad died. And so I just took on that, just take on the role. Do I have another brother? Yeah. Yeah, I have another brother, but he's he's never been the one to take the lead and, and take responsibility. And we, I'm not going to deny that there's been some conflict and stuff between the two of us over the past 15 years or so. So I wasn't really anticipating that he would be participating anyways. But my son had agreed that he would, he wanted to. He's been talking about helping to take care of his grandparents his whole life since he was 10. And so he kept insisting, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. So we started making arrangements to have my parents move in and we uh, went up to Victorville and we had to clean out their little home, which was falling apart. It's not like I moved my parents out of a really nice home. They were living in a 40 to 50 year old mobile home in a neighborhood that used to be quite quaint for retirees. But now it's as if those retirees had died off and left their mobile homes to their, I don't know, junky family members. And so now it became a drug-ridden, junk-looking neighborhood. And their place was falling apart, and mom and dad didn't have the ability to fix it up anymore. Dad was no longer capable. Now, this time, I didn't know that he had the Parkinson's. I just thought he was depressed and just whatever. But reading through my journals, I've realized that, the, that he's been symptomatic for 10 years. I guess that's the, one of the weird benefits of the journal is that 
you document things that you forget about later. And now I'm realizing I've been worried about my dad and his cognitive abilities for 10 years. And he's been my business partner my whole life. I've worked with my dad. I'm also learning about the, the dynamics between my parents and me and my role in the family. I just, so I moved my parents in and we sold their place up there and they lived with me for the two and a half years. Meanwhile, there's just been some family stuff that has happened that is just not, I don't know, let's just say I had some repressed childhood traumas that were resurfaced, creating some PTSD. And even with the dialogue I was having with my therapist, who also was I had working with my mother, I had to come to the realization that in order for me to heal from all these wounds, I had to separate from my parents. I'm not going to air the whole dirty laundry of my parental relationship, but one thing I realized is there's narcissistic abuse, there's borderline personality disorder, there's codependency, there's triangulation, there's this family dynamics. It's like everything I learned in grad school, I realized that I don't know if I was necessarily in complete denial that it was happening, but maybe denial that it was a problem. Not really thinking I'm smarter than that, but believing that I could manage it. I had to tell, I have, I've told several people that I've always known that there were issues. And I learned much more about it, even the terminology, when I went to grad school. And then when, and, but then I became a therapist. And when it came time to move my parents in with me so I could take care of them, realizing that or thinking at the time, I'm a therapist now, I'll be able to, I'll be able to manage and navigate and cope through, with it. Didn't, not really fully expecting the, the trauma that would be exposed and that I was really struggling with the PTSD from some of these childhood traumas that were resurfacing. And then the things that my, my mother or my father would say who would just send me down a path that it was like a WTF kind of a deal, thinking, believing that I didn't even really know my parents. So there were several things that happened that I was encouraged by other professionals who deal with or work with the aging and caregiving and end of life issues said, you guys got to separate because it's no longer safe for any of you. And so that's when I had to make the very tough decision that I needed to place my parents in assisted living. And frankly, it was a good thing because now they have meals prepared every day, activities to do, to engage in should they choose to. It's a safe environment. It's warm, it's cozy, and there's other people around that are their age which are things that I could not offer my parents in my own home. Sure, it was fine when my son was there and I had help, but I still have a business to run. And the only way that I can afford to maintain that household was to work. And it's an exhausting kind of a job being a therapist. And sometimes I work until seven o'clock at night. I wasn't there to fix meals for them. And I wasn't there to you know, entertain them. And I wasn't able to, I was, wasn't able to take them out for outings or anything like that. You add that to the fact that there's like other emotional dynamics going on. It was, it was pretty challenging, really challenging. And I've worked with clients who have been their caregiver of their parents and given up their entire lives. And then they're, and then they end up in therapy because they feel like they wasted their whole life for a parent who didn't really care much about them, but they felt obligated to do it. And I guess the message here is that there are safe places for our family. And the more people that I talk to who are in the field, the aging, whether it's that's just the hospice or the assisted living, all say that family members should not be doing this at the end of life because it, sh it just shifts your entire relationship because they now become toddlers and you have to be the boss of them, but they don't like it very much. And that's exactly what I was experiencing.
And as hard as it was, as hard as this decision as it was, I had to do it for my sanity and for their safety. Instead. That was the decision, the reason why I decided to buy the trailer. And I realized that now it's, I've been writing and just been contemplating the, the idea, the notion of getting a trailer for more than three years. At the time earlier, I wasn't necessarily looking to live in it. I was looking to be a weekend warrior, basically just go out on weekends and have camping trips to be by myself and still maintain my household and what have you. But when it came time where I was advised, basically, you need to get them placed into assisted living, You're, I'm overwhelmed and underqualified to manage. So when it came time to place them, that's when I just, because I was only renting that house that I was in and it was, it was too big for one person and rent's going up. And yeah, I could have got an apartment or a condo or another house to rent, but I wanted something completely different, something completely new, something I've never done before. And frankly, I was tired of the same old business model that I've gone done. Because I've been doing this journal review. I've been trying the coaching and online programs and stuff like that for 10 years. And it just, I never had the magic bullet. Yeah, I did okay. But still, it was my psychotherapy practice that was still paying my bills. So I, I wasn't making any kind of headway. So cut it all off, shut it off vanish and just go work on myself. So that's what I've been doing for the past five and a half months. Beautiful thing is having a trailer, I can go wherever I want. So I could be boondocking in Sedona, which is what I'd love to do, and still be able to do the heart math technique and make a little extra money there while I still maintain my California private practice and just bounce back and forth. I still do want to travel a lot, but this is just part of the journey where I figure it out and not quite sure where I'm going to end up, but I'm going to, I'm going to try this thing. I'm going to look into Sedona and see what happens there. As of now, I really want to head up to the national parks up in Utah and Colorado. A lot of it has, depends on my parents because I'm not going to be unavailable for them either. Yeah, there's other family members, but where, I don't know where they are, honestly. I'm out here solo and quiet and not stirring anything up with the family, just watching and observing to see who steps up because so far nobody has. And honestly, my caregiver laid into them about it, said, where's everybody else? Why, why is it only Kelly? Why is she the only one who's taking care of matters? You have nobody else? And now having some outside people looking in, this is the first because I realized that my role in my family has always been the buck stops with Kelly. Anything that's going, everything just floats downhill, all shit. But I was the one catching it all. I'm the cleanup crew and it's been a very painful and lonely and thankless task. And... I think I said that when I was out in the wilderness, I have a mental breakdown. I definitely had an emotional one. It definitely was, it's like my therapist called it emotionally waterboarded, where I was just hit with so much stuff from my childhood and my past with my relationship with my parents that it's been really difficult to just process. But that is what I'm out here doing. Now I'm down to just two and a half more journals that need to be reviewed. And then I'm done with that project and I have some other ones that I want to do. So, but the, my update is that I'm back in Mesa after five days in Temecula. I ended up getting sick. Driving back here was nuts because the high winds, the storm was coming. I was literally running away from the storm and there was high winds as I was driving the trailer. I will tell you that I'm getting much more confident with pulling the trailer. That's no longer an issue. I'm confident with the boondocking now. I have learned a great deal and I'm glad for that. I still have a lot more to learn. Like I was sharing with a friend of mine, Dawn, when I came to see her in Temecula, I told her I'm really glad that I had all these things that I had to learn because it's been able to help me not be so hyper-focused on all the pain that I left behind. And I think that's what, if there's a lesson that you need to learn or that I want to share is that when you're leaving something behind, Give yourself something to look forward to. Don't just wallow in the grief. Yeah, I'm grieving, but I also have things that I'm working on. And so learning this stuff about the trailer, 
And having a puppy to take care of has helped with my healing process because I'm not wallowing. I don't, I don't cry every day. I'm still grieving. There's definitely that going on. I'm still working through things. There's definitely a lot of that happening. And don't put a time limit on it. I had really th thought it would be 90 days to go through my journals. Didn't realize how in-depth it would be. I am doing a lot more of transcribing stuff that I do want to hang on to, like insights or character development or a setting or a scene or a huh kind of a thing or a learning experience. So now here I am almost six months into it and I'm not done. So remember that healing also, there's no time limit on it. So more to come later. Right now I think I need to take my dog out and then go put him to bed for a little bit. But uh, the adventures of Kismet and Kelly continue. Thanks for keep coming back. More to come.